Wofford head coach Jay McCauley is with us, about to embark on his second season with the Terriers. I'm Brian Fenley with Fox Sports Radio. Jay, it's a pleasure to have you on. And if I'm not mistaken, right when you took over, you had your head coaching debut with Wofford. Your wife gives birth to your second child. Were you trying to get as much done in a single day as possible? Because you certainly maximized your day. Yeah, we thought we'd just cram it all uh, in one day, that whole experience, first head coaching game. And uh, obviously, we were blessed to have our second daughter that later that evening. But uh, thus, the gray streaks coming in, Brian. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of gray hair coming in. And uh, it was a fun, fun year for us. It was a wild year, but uh, one that uh, we enjoyed every minute of it. I bet you must have enjoyed the win against North Carolina particularly a non-conference play last season. What did Roy Williams say to you after that game? He's very professional. Uh, he's got a great reputation in our profession and just congratulated us. Uh, you know, obviously that program's got so much history. And then Carmichael's just a place where they rarely play anymore. So to go in there and win and do it during that game and go up there for the second year, uh, and get a win it was really special for our guys. And he was just really complimentary of how hard we played and how together we played. And as you know, Brian, when, when Wofford plays that way, we've got a chance to win uh, a lot of games. And uh, that's just something we're trying to continue here. I definitely know firsthand account being an alum of UNC Greensboro and being on the losing side of most of the matchups with Wofford over the years. You guys have developed a dynasty so you've got a couple daughters. Now that you've been able to spend some time with them during this little lull in the action, what's the silliest activity, say your oldest daughter, has done with you that you enjoy? I'll give you a couple quick okay. ones. They have stretched my limits here as a dad. And I grew up with all brothers okay. and boys in the house for the most part in my my wife's the complete opposite. So when we had two daughters, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. <laughs> uh, and uh, I mean, from painting my toenails, of course, I don't go outside after that. We'll <laughs> move to, my, uh, to TikToks, to Disney Plus. I mean, you name it. Our day is jam packed with uh, with fun activities. And it's just really cool uh, for a lot of dads that are coaches, I think, during this time, because we're used to being on the road. We're used to being with our team. We're used to be doing camps in the summer and it can really stretch you in a lot of ways and make your kids come to your workplace where this time's allowed me to be at home and help a lot. So I've been very lucky, like a lot of coaches, to spend more quality time and uh, certainly make some memories and have some laughs. Yeah, no doubt. You've got the family at home. You also have this family environment that you have created at Wofford and as far as cultivating that that sort of family oriented environment what has it taken to do that because this is something that I've noticed that your team has mastered over the years yeah I, th I think it's that top-down leadership and it starts with kind of the culture that Wofford's administration creates and then they hire in my opinion really quality people that they feel and entrust these athletic teams to. And from there, they trust that you hire great people and recruit good players. I think that's number one, Brian. And number two, Coach Young, who is an incredible mentor of mine and someone who won a lot of ball games here and built this thing from the ground up. Uh, he just had a really good way about him to inject that positivity in that culture uh, that you want to have in a basketball team because the season's long Brian yeah and it's a lot of ups and downs and if you don't have that stability in your locker room and that leadership within um, you know you're gonna hit some bumps in the road but I think overall uh, the longevity of our program and moving forward we've got that baseline that foundation of a culture and a good locker room and that gets us through a lot um, you know, every team goes through those injuries and, you know, sure. last second losses and wish we would have grabbed that rebound. But your culture is sustainable and keep, keeps you keeps you that way throughout the season. So very lucky to have Coach Young who built this place the way it is, and we're just hoping to continue that. 
Jay McCauley joins us, head coach for Wofford. I'm Brian Fenley. You speak of the long-standing tradition of basketball success at, at Wofford, and that brings me to my next question, Jay. When you assess the best mid-major programs, where do you think Wofford stands right now, and where do you think that they can get to elevate in the pecking order? That's a great question, Brian. You know, we don't like to compare ourselves to a whole lot of people. I just try to I try to keep our guys focused on just doing their job every day. And I know there's questions like these that uh, are asked, and I don't think it's a bad thing to answer it. I just like our guys to focus on the things that they can control. But as a coach, being an assistant and now a head coach, and being away from Wofford for a few years, there's no question that Wofford's got to be one of the best mid-major programs in the country to win five titles in the last 10 years in one of the best mid-major leagues, I don't see where you see another team in mid-major ball do that. And the ones that stick out to you, the Murray States, the Belmonts, uh, you know, the Northern Iowas, there's plenty of others. Um, you know, there's no question we're in that equation. And I think as long as we continue to recruit good people and quality talent, I think the sky's the limit for us. And we were we were this close two years ago to – really making a splash and getting to the Sweet 16. And that's a dream of every coach and every player that comes through here. Part of almost getting to the Sweet 16 was the play of Fletcher McGee, who I believe in that win over Seton Hall had seven three-pointers. And I'd seen on, I think it was Twitter, Coach, where you had talked about Fletcher and said he is one of the most dedicated competitors I've ever been around. You know how well he's been as a three-point shooter. We've seen him dazzle now overseas. What's been so special about him and even getting the chance to coach him? Yeah, he's a perfectionist. And <laughs> every one of those guys is a little goofy. Uh, they have their own personality. Uh, but a guy you really love being around every day, a guy that works his tail off and – you know, he raises the level, I think, for his teammates. That's a sign of a really good leader and a really good competitor. So he certainly elevated us in a lot of different ways and allowed us to do some really cool things, Brian, offensively, that I think you're seeing a lot of other teams do to space the floor. And when you've got the all-time leader in three-point field goal, field goals made in college history, you can do a lot of interesting things. And so it's helped us in recruiting. And he's going to play ball for a long time. He loves ball. He's a hard worker. He's got aspirations to play at the highest level. And uh, he was here in town a week ago running his own camp. Okay. And so whenever he's not playing, he's involved in basketball anyways. So it just speaks to his commitment, his passion. And if I could find another Fletcher McGee, that would be uh, – That'd be great for our program. I, I think you might. Knowing your recruiting history, you will find a similar talent as, as McGee. And like we said, how dominant he was from the three-point line. You pointed out that, yeah, your players can be goofy. How about the goofiness of Coach McCauley? When does that come through, whether in practice or in a game or on the team bus or somewhere away from the cameras and the limelight? Yeah, there's no question I've got uh... – you know, humor aside to me, you have to if uh, if you're going to coach. And if you're just always on your guys about every little detail sure. for nine months, they're going to tune you out. So we try to do things here and there within the locker room in our meetings before and after games to keep things light. Uh, I just remember as a player, I always made fun of my coach and his mannerisms. I'm sur sure that happened to me. <laughs> throughout the year. I've got my own little quirks, but uh, funny story after yes. UMC, we go to celebrate in the locker room. I'm, I'm very cautious of that. And I learned that from coach young and some great mentors. I'm not celebrating on somebody else's court, but waiting till we get to the locker room to, gotcha. yeah. to celebrate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they had a tile floor in Carmichael, an old tile floor that got wet from the players already celebrating. And I came in and I slipped like right on my back. I must have got three feet in the air, horizontal, landed on my back, and my players just dogpiled on me. I had to play it off like it was a charge or something. <laughs> but, uh, you know, those things you can make fun of your coaches yeah. for, and I love that because it keeps things light. 
and it shows you you got a personality a little bit. So that's something that I'll I'll continue to do. Yeah, a little levity doesn't hurt, especially when you're not too self-conscious about it. It's part of your personality, as you said, and I think that players are gravitated towards that. You look ahead at what you've got next season and the outlook of your roster because I guess one of the first things would have to be how do you replace a guy like Nathan Hoover, who I actually covered when he was in high school back in the day. So he has been so fun to watch and, and what a treat he has been for you guys. But when you think of a guy like that leaving, leaving and moving on and exhausting his eligibility, where do you go from here? Yeah, we, we lost 65% of our scoring and rebounding when Fletcher and Cam Jackson, those guys graduated two years ago. Now you lose Nathan Hoover, another top 20 scorer all time in Wofford and a guy that's won a lot of games and provides a lot of experience along with Trevor Stump and Chavez Goodwin. Uh, we graduated a lot of production, so we'll be young. Um, Nathan's going to play professionally. We've developed a lot of pros over the years. He's no different. He loves, he loves playing um, and certainly gave us a huge, huge shot in the arm in some big games over his career. So we'll be a little young again, but Storm Murphy, you know, Ryan Larson, Trey Howell, some of our older guys that have played in games two in a lot of minutes will lead the way. But we got we got four or five newcomers that we're going to be leaning on and throwing into the fire. The the preponderance or the the abundance of players who you have seen leave Wofford and go on to play professionally overseas or whatnot. How hands-on are you in helping facilitate your ex-players and getting that shot professionally as far as like a mentorship role or relationship building with other teams and, and just sort of helping elevate your players to that next level and hoping they get that shot? Yeah, I think early on when I was here as an assistant in 2008 to 10, we had just started getting a few pros out there. And now 10 years removed, Brian, we've got a reputation for developing pros. We've had 25 pros in the last decade. And so agents that are always looking for quality mid-major skilled guys that do really well overseas or in the G League or what have you, we've got this reputation not only as a good mid-major program, but as a program that develops those type of skill sets you need in pro ball. So, you know, at first we were like trying to get our guys out there to get seen and sure with quality agents now it's like they know what they're getting out of a Wofford player so word of mouth uh, we it's funny the the quarantine time we've been calling zoom calls like this with yeah. former players that are still playing pro ball 10 12 year careers wow. and so they help facilitate those relationships with their agents and the do's and don'ts of where to go and where not to yeah. go so it's a it's a it's a situation where we'll help a lot as a staff, but there's a lot of things that just the Waffer name brings to the table when you when you graduate here. Oh, there's such a street cred to having that Waffer to your name across your jersey. You touched on the newcomers. When you look at the new pa the new batch that's coming in, who do you feel like is going to make the biggest impact early on, or some of the guys who you're super excited to get into this program and they'll be able to contribute right away yeah I think our staff did a good job of uh we held one scholarship over in the transition uh because it was real late in the spring uh so we we signed three early and then got one late and then got a transfer late that's eligible as well nice. and those five guys all fit you know certain depth spots that we need to fulfill our roster but you know, Max Klesman is another point guard, highly talented point guard from Wisconsin. Obviously, Storm Murphy's from Wisconsin. He's a senior, four-year starter. Uh, but, you know, Max is very under-recruited. And turns out he was the number one point guard in the state of Wisconsin by the end of his senior year. So our staff did a good job evaluating him. He just fits. He's going to be another Wofford guy, in my opinion. Yeah. And then Keaton Turner led his team in scoring. Um, in Ohio, player of the year, you know, state playoffs. Mm -hmm. um, a guy that reminds me a lot of Josh Sharkey from Sanford. He was mm. just short, quick, and can really be explosive. So we got two really guards there, good guards there, Brian, that we're excited about. And then we had to really add depth at the at the post position. Sure. 
So Sam Godwin's a 6'9 lefty from Oklahoma. I think that speaks to the NCAA tournament and our brand getting out there oh, and we're totally. stretching our recruiting a little bit. And then Nick Pringle's a local guy from the coast uh, at Wales Branch High School who's 6'9", but grew eight inches the last three years. Oh my gosh. So he is uh, – we're super excited about him. He's got a, a lot of guard skills, just like Sam. And then we got BJ from uh, – BJ Mack from South Florida, who is a 6'8", 265-pound, versatile, versatile post player. So try to add a lot of skill and versatility. And uh, if we need another spot, I hear you can shoot a little bit, too. We might add you to the fold. I, I would love that. Man, I was obsessed growing up with playing basketball. That short corner jumper on the left side, money from 10 feet. You know, yeah. you're Fletcher trying to McGee, break. Nathan Hoover, now you, Brian. <laughs> let's go. You you're trying to break. I'm a zone killer, Coach. I get in there and find those open seams and, and knock down those mid-range jumpers, which I don't know about you, but it's seemingly on the professional level the mid-range jumper is a lost art these days. Everybody wants to shoot the three. And yeah. what I've heard, and you would know better than me, Coach, but it seems that the influx and influence of the international game and their love of shooting the three has trickled its way to the American game even more because there was that time, Coach, in the early 2000s where USA basketball was having some, some trouble with some of those international teams, you might recall. Yeah, yeah, there's no question – you know, the international game is has really kind of morphed into stretching positionless basketball. And you see that in the NBA draft, and you see that, you know, with more and more markets overseas becoming stronger professional leagues. And there's no question. I mean, look at Gonzaga, St. Mary's. I mean, Greensboro had Francis. Uh, yeah. You know, just guys that are really, really good shooters that come over here uh, that can really help your program. So – that's something we look into a little bit. And uh, if you can shoot, we're going to recruit. That's my saying. I love it, man. I love it. It's got a little rhyme to it. So you know how dominant the SOCON is, the Southern Conference, as far as a really sustainable and competitive mid-major conference. How do you feel like it's perceived nationally, that conference, but – in a way, do you feel like it's not getting enough credit as it should? Because like you said, a lot of these guys are going professionally. You are making the NCAA tournament all the time, and then you're seeing others step in and beat these Power 5 schools in non-conference games. Right. Yeah, I think that's uh, something over time. When Davidson and a few schools left yeah. our league, everyone's feeling was that the SOCOM was going to drop. And to the SOCON's credit and all the presidents involved, we added some really good teams. And it's really fun to watch the different teams. It's not like a, you know, Big Ten's got a style of play. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't really deviate from that. But the SOCON's got so many different philosophies that make every night exciting and, you know, fun, fun to watch. And it's dangerous to prepare for uh, if you're playing, you know, the big boys and, obviously tournament games where everybody loves an upset. So sure. I think the more you see games like ours versus North Carolina or other teams in our league win those games, you know, our reputation grows by the day. And we were this close to getting two teams in a few years ago. And obviously last year the, the tournament got canceled. Sure. I think we're seeing our league really represent itself well and have – obviously every reason to be in the discussion for a multi-bid league moving forward if we can keep that up. I, I totally agree with you on that, Coach. Jay McCauley joins us. I'm Brian Fenley. And finishing up here, Coach, you know, you've got some kiddos rolling around the house and you've got to attend to. How about this? What's the hardest decision you've ever had to make during a game? Hardest decision I ever had to make uh, was probably um, – sitting a senior last year during senior night late in the game because a freshman was playing and producing a little bit better. And uh, you're always faced with those things. But at the end of the day, you know, people that come to Wofford and sign up for Wofford know it's about one thing and it's about winning. And I think that's why you see not a whole lot of transfers coming and going, you know, with our program, because 
we kind of talk about those things every day. And if it's good enough for the team, then it doesn't matter what, what grade you're in or what, what year you're in. So for me as a first year head coach to do that was, uh, you know, something I had to go with, with my gut and what my staff thought, but you're faced with all those little decisions throughout every game and you just can't second guess yourself. And like I said, trust your gut as best you can. My final question for you, Jay, seems that ESPN trusted their gut when they had you in the, was it top 40, under 40 or something like that as far as head coaches? It, that has to be a pretty special award given that, look, you just partook in your first head coaching first season and your staff is really young too. You've got guys that are what, under 30 too? Yeah, yeah. It's a really young staff, but I've worked with all of them. I trust them. Uh, and know what they're about. And they really helped me and help our team. But, you know, I know I was 40 under 40, but again, back to my gray hair, people could think <laughs> I'm under that 50 range here coming up soon. But it's just, it's just something I think that uh, speaks volumes to our program. And any individual accolade that I get or our players get, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. It's about our team. And as long as we keep that in perspective, you know, I think Walford basketball will be in good hands moving forward. You literally just took my tagline. I was going to say, it goes without saying, with Coach McCauley, Wofford is in good hands moving <laughs> forward. <laughs> Jay, this was a pleasure. I am super stoked for you and the progression of this program, and I am so stoked to see what happens in your near future with the Terriers. I will be watching, and I hope that uh, we can meet sometime soon. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate you having me. And if you're ever in Spartanburg, man, come on by. We'll get some lunch and uh, see a couple uh, games or something like that. I appreciate you having me on. Oh, yeah. We are going to do it. Rest assured when we get games back. And we will do it soon. Coach McCauley, I'm Brian Fenley.